Greetings, Glitter Gang, and welcome back to Catherine Scraps Live. My name is Catherine, and this is the final part of the evening show on Thursday, May 4th. We just completed all the matting for the spring album. And now what we're going to do is, this is going to be another planning session, so we're going to be working on uh, inserts. And I want to have a few, I, want, I would like to have three inserts. So I'm going to get my planning notebook. And I think this is going to be the last project in this notebook. As you can see, we're pretty much out of paper at this point. All right. So we made this album seven inches across so that it'll easily hold things that are six and a half inches across. So this largest pocket is 10 inches. So I'm thinking we make the tag six and a half by nine and a half. And we'll just do, so, okay, let's, if we did six and a half by eight and seven eighths, it wouldn't go all the way to the top. However, no, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. I, let's stick to six and a half by nine and a half and we'll, 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 okay, so uh, we're going to say large tag. Uh, for the big pockets and I'm just going to write 7 by 10 here so that you know it's for that 7 by 10 pocket. So they're going to be 6 and a half by 9 and a half and we are going to need um, 6 of those. Alright, so then let's call this the medium. So this is going to go in the seven by seven pocket. So now we want to think about what are we going to put in the seven by seven pocket? And I'm thinking I might want to put two things. I might want to put a tag that holds a vertical photo. So, cause this would hold horizontal photos. So let's do one that's, um, okay, so I'm going to have some math. Uh, all right, so the photo, all right, hold on. Okay, I want it to be big enough to have a photo mat and like a little one inch by whatever label. So the, the photo mat is six and a half. If I add a one inch label, that makes it seven and a half, which means it would stick up above this, which I'm okay with because that'll give like a layered look. So let's do, um, and then it's one eighth, two eighths, and then, um, so that's one quarter plus whatever we want up here at the top, which I want another inch. So one and a quarter inches plus one inches, two and a quarter inches plus six and a half is eight and a half eight and three quarters. Now at eight and three quarters, it's getting kind of big. Maybe it needs to go in here. So there's two tags, a wide tag and a tall tag. So let's do, uh, it'll be four and a half by eight. And what did I say? Three quarters, six and a half, seven and a half, eight and a half plus, yeah, eight and three quarters. And we want six of those. All right, so those are two tags. Okay, so we've got tags, large tags. Okay, and then for now we'll, we'll go to medium. So one thing we could do is a photo wallet that was, let's see if we made it six and a half inches square. Okay. So it's six and a half inches by six and a half inches. And then we could get a, you know, a, a four and a half by six and a half inch photo in the middle, but then we could also make a flap 
to put another photo on it that's like four and a half by six and a half. And then what if we made like a a skinny two inch flap to do like a little tiny strip of journaling and we connected them with a button and string closure so that they made kind of a gatefold. Yeah. Okay. So let's think about the pieces and parts that we would need for that. So six and a half by, I want to say, let's do six and a half by eight and a half and put the two uh, bits that would attach them, make them part of the, of the base. Since we already can't get more than one from a sheet, so we would need, uh, so six and a half, or eight, it's eight and a half. by six and a half. Okay, and we want six of those. And then we need a, a piece that's four and a half by six and a half. We need six of those. And then we want a piece that's two inches by four and a half to make the gate. And we'll just do that as a cute little journaling spot, whatever. So that's two inches by six and a half. We need six of those. And that will make the photo wallet. That'll go in this square pocket right here. And then here in the front, I think we'll just do um, in the envelope. We're going to just do, I'm just going to do goodies, I think. Um, we'll just do four, uh, six and a half inch by four and a half inch photo mats. We'll just do one in each. And then I'm just going to write goodies because this is where we're going to put like little bits and bobs from the collection that we want to keep. So that's what we'll do. So I'm going to hold this up uh, so that you can pause and write this down. So this is um, the inserts for this. So this large one is the two tag style inserts that are going to go in this big pocket at the top. Then this medium one is the, the photo wallet with the button and string closure that's going to go in the middle. And then this one at the bottom is a for a photo mat to go in the envelope. And then we're going to add like little tags and journaling spots and such from the collection. So there you go. Okay, so um, if you're watching in the archives or on YouTube, you just go ahead and pause, take a screenshot of that so you have all those measurements and that's what we're going to do so let's make one of each so we can we we can see them all i'm going to start with the medium one i'm just going to leave that right there so you can see it okay so i'm going to get more of my cardstock so i'm going to need quite a bit of cardstock to make these at least, I don't know, I want to say at least 12 sheets. So, of course, and just as a reminder, you don't have to make all of them. <laughs> uh, just because they're, they're there, you know, you can mix and match. Obviously, you know, adjust all this stuff for your own needs. All right. I'm going to cut three at a time. One, two, three. One, two, three. These are going to be uh, for the six um, medium ones. That's where I'm starting. Cut eight and a half by six and a half. So I'm going to make my first cut at six and a half. And then turn it and cut it eight and a half. And that'll allow me to get this big tag from the remnant. Okay. So you'll see what I mean. So my first cut is at six and a half. Okay. And then I'm going to turn it and cut it eight and a half. All right. So that gets me one, two, three of this measurement right here. But I also have this piece right here 
which is five and a half by 12. So I can use it to get this four and a half by eight and three quarter inch piece. Alright, so that way, you know, we're not wasting cardstock. Alright, so now I'm just going to repeat that and then I'll get all the tags and all the bases and that'll be that. So there's the other one, two, three bases. And then I have this piece. And the final three tags. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a little tick by each of those so I know I'm done. And I'll just check my scraps to see if any of them are big enough for any of my remaining pieces, and they are not. So we'll get more sheets. Okay. All right, so next let's do the next largest which is this six and a half by nine and a half inch for the big tag. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut them at six and a half, then nine and a half. And then out of this remnant, I can get these four and a half by six and a half, at least one of these. So. So there's a way that you can cut to maximize your cardstock as well. So it's six and a half by nine and a half. All right, one, two, three of those. And then I have a five and a half inch wide piece and I need a four and a half inch by six and a half inch piece. So I'll just cut this to six and a half and then to four and a half. And I've got one, two, three of those and I'm going to put them here because they belong to this medium. And then we'll repeat that. So we've got one, two, three. So that's all our six and a half inch by nine and a half inch tags. So I can go ahead and check them off. And here's one, two, three, the remaining four and a half by six and a half pieces. Okay, so now all we have left is these six, four and a half by six and a half inch pieces and these four, two inch by six and a half inch pieces. And I can't get any of them out of my current remnants, but I can get them with, I think, two five by seven pinwheels. So let's 
Let's do that. Okay, so to do the five by seven pinwheel, you cut, you need a trimmer like this where you can choose where you start and stop your blade. You put it at your cardstock at five inches and you cut from the bottom up to five inches. Then you stop, you turn it, you put it back at five inches and you cut again up to five inches and that's gonna give you one five by seven piece. And then you can just finish it off. All right. So that got me four of them. I need a total of six. So I'm going to do it again. Five and five. Five and five. Five and five turn. Five and five pull off. Turn, five and five, pull off, turn, five, all the way up to the top, pull off, pull off. All right, so now I have a stack of eight five by seven mats. I need four to, or excuse me, I need six to be cut down to six and a half by four and a half to go in the pockets as photo mats. And I, then I need six two inch by six and a half inch pieces. I think I can get them. So we'll see. So we have one, two, three, one, two, three, and then the other two. So I'm gonna start with the four by six photo mats. So I've got one, two, three of those. Let's do the other three. All right, one, two, three. So we can check these off. So now we're gonna get the two inch ones. And I can get one, two, three, four. Ooh, I can't get them all out of these remaining two pieces. So close, so close though. <laughs> so very close. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the scraps that I have from constructing the album Because there's definitely going to be some pieces in there. Right? Yeah. I have some scraps from there I can use to finish it off. Oh, I miscounted. Because here's one, two, three, four. Oh, no, that is how many I thought I would get. Okay, never mind. I didn't miscount. I just don't know how to math. Surprising no one. And I do save my construction scraps until I'm done, just for this reason. So, all right, now we've got them. All right, so these, the tags, we're not gonna, I mean, those aren't constructed, obviously. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna stick them in their pockets.
and we'll turn them into tags and add photo mats and pattern paper and all of that. That's all coming. So don't worry. Oh no, we lost Omar. All right. And then the uh, four by six photo mats. ahead and put them in their pockets. How did Omar get his name? Omar is actually the name of a horse I knew, Pat. And I think Gretchen knows the story, but for those of you who are new enough to not know the story of Omar, if you have the archives, all you have to do is just go in the archives and type Omar in the search bar and it'll bring you up. I do have a video telling the story of Omar. But essentially, when I was in college, I house sat for some people who had a horse named Omar, and it's an extremely long story. But to make that extremely long story short, basically, I changed Omar's entire life. I took him from a pain-ridden, arthritic horse who couldn't, who couldn't tolerate a rider anymore I basically cured his arthritis and he almost died. In fact, everyone was so sure he was going to die that the owner gave me the number for the process, the processing plant. Okay. Where I was going to call them. They're going to pick up his body to process it. Um, but basically personally saved his life like a super, like a superhuman. Um, it's a very long, like, and it's funny. So like I said, if you have access to the archives and you want to know the story of Omar and then later on in this album, I might be able to tell it if we have like something we're doing that's like repetitive, but it takes about an hour to tell the whole story. So I'm not going to start it now, but I did once know a horse named Omar. I saved his life. Not only did I save his life, but I like ch changed the quality of his life. Um, and if you think I'm exaggerating, I am not. Because years later, I ran into Omar's owner out of bed, <laughs> bath and beyond. And she like stopped me and grabbed my hand to like thank me for basically like turning Omar into a new horse. But like it involves a whole host of like me accosting little kids in 4-H sweaters and dragging them out to the farm where Omar was to get them to tell me what was wrong with Omar and all this kind of stuff. And so... <laughs> And like me calling every vet in the valley in and all all of them were at an emergency thing. So I ended up with like a horse chiropractor out there to like try and save Omar on and on and on. OK, so it's just like this one summer where I house sat for this horse named Omar. And the thing that makes it even funnier is that Omar hated me and wanted me to die. So the fact. <laughs> So, so it's not even like we got along or anything, you know, <laughs> so, um, but yeah. Okay. So now we're working on the, the medium, this, uh, this piece. So we're going to score it one on the eight and a half inch edge. This is the eight and a half inch by six and a half inch piece along the eight and a half inch edge. We're going to score at one inch and at seven and a half inches. And we're going to score all six of them. But yeah, Omar despised me, hated me. Um, no matter what I did for Omar, he just couldn't stand it. Uh, did try to kill 
one of the vets. I mean, it was, it's a lot. So yes, if you have access to the archives, you can find it. I did label a video that contains the Omar the horse story in there. So you, anytime you want to hear the Omar the horse story, all you have to do is go in the archives and in the search bar type Omar. That's his name. That's why he's called Omar. The, that's why he's called Omar. But, um, Omar hated me because he wanted to die and I wouldn't let him. <laughs> it's probably true. Omar was probably like, why are you prolonging my life? <laughs> and like, I, Omar, because Omar hated me so bad, I couldn't, like, we couldn't get medication in him. I mean, the horse chiropractor couldn't. So, like, we had to, um, I had to track down in the middle of the night his previous owner and get them to come out to the farm to like calm Omar down so he would take his medicine his who even know who even knows what that was by the way by the way it wasn't going to save Omar it did calm him down and he 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 chilled out and it he I do think it helped him get through the night I don't know what it was but uh he was going to die of toxic shock um because he had a twisted intestine so he needed uh, a lot more help than a pill you know um, but we were able to keep him alive long enough for the other vet to finish birthing the calf or whatever he was doing and drive out to the farm at like five o'clock in the morning. That poor guy. Um, and actually save Omar. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to let this horse. This is not, I am not going to get a horse killer reputation so but anyway like i said if you have access to archives just type omar in the search bar and you will be able to listen to the story it's very funny um it's, it has a happy ending so no you don't have to worry <laughs> about anything befalling any horses so yeah all right so what i'm going to do now that i've folded and scored is we're going to add tape and I'm going to add the tape next to the score line but not touching it all right I want to see a line of uh, cardstock in between I always say I'm, um, I'm going to write a Hallmark Christmas movie. I'm going to take the story of Omar and I'm going to move it from the summer to, to Christmas. And I'm going to just write a, <laughs> write a Hallmark movie, Hallmark Christmas movie. But there's also a lot of lessons in the Omar the horse story. Lesson one is if a horse comes with the house and farm you're buying and you're a psychiatrist that splits half your time between the country and like Chicago, um, you should maybe just say no thanks to the horse because uh, you don't know anything about horses. <laughs> And so when you hire the people to house sit for you, sit for you, you can't give them any coherent instructions. Um, and so they can't take care of the horse either. And also don't horse sit exactly, Bev. Don't horse it is another another good if someone says hey i need some people to house sit my country mansion and take care of my horse and you and your three friends think that sounds like a pretty good deal for a place to stay 
near the campus over the summer while you're doing working for the college over the summer you know do look that gift horse in the mouth definitely um, from Omar I learned why we say that people who have died have kicked the bucket um, because the one thing Omar was committed to as he was dying and he was definitely dying was kicking over his water bucket every time I righted it and refilled it with water he kicked it over again um, so I was like oh I get that I get that saying now <laughs> I get that saying now um, but yeah but it has a happy ending Omar lives to ruin someone else's life Okay, so now that those have all been taped on their flaps, again, these are the eight and a half inch by six and a half inch pieces. Now we're just going to put the other two parts to the closure on them. I'm just going to go ahead and burnish all of them. <laughs> Melanie says he'd probably have drunk it if you filled it with beer. He was a country horse. Well, and it's funny because, um, you know, part of the Omar issue is like when I would interact with like horse professionals trying to get help and stuff for Omar, I know like one question people would ask all the time is what is his breed? And like, and the first person who asked me what kind of horse he was, I said brown. <laughs> and then I said old, old and brown. So, <laughs> like, imagine these poor people trying to talk <laughs> to me about this horse. There we go. Oh, that's going to be so cute. All right, so we're going to put a button and string closure like so. We'll decorate this with sayings, so we'll find journaling spots and such, and that's what can go there. be uh, Omar. Whew. You can also put it like this if you want to, so they can go either way in the book. But yeah. Ah, uh, Omar.
If Omar was still around, let's see, he was probably, I think he was around 15 years old when I was around 20. So he would be in his late 30s, which I don't think horses live to their late 30s, but I don't know for sure. What book am I reading now? So the book I'm reading now is I'm reading that biography of Jim Jones called The Road to Jonestown. So that's my current book. And I think I'm also going to read, because it's quite a long book and I'm not always in the mood for nonfiction. I'm also going to read Cat's Cradle. I think I'm finally going to get around to that. Um, years ago... I found this NPR, uh, NPR had worked with some science fiction company to make this decision tree and it was what science fiction classics should you read and it was this gigantic decision tree that had a hundred different classics on it, science fiction classics and depending on you know how you answer the questions, you, it would take you to what would be your perfect science fiction book and my final question, which led to the final branch of my tree, was, do you like time travel? And if I said yes, it took me to Slaughterhouse-Five, which I have read, and that is an excellent book. And then if I said no, it took me to Cat's Cradle. So I, my goal was to eventually read both of them. Um, so... There we go. Um, it's really interesting. I like. I don't know that much about Jonestown. I know the basics. You know, he had an integrated cult. He convinced a bunch of people to move to South America um, and start a, and for on a commune. And then they all drank poisoned Kool Aid, and it was the largest mass. Um, uh, suicide in history still to this day um, and and that I knew that that was the origin of the phrase drink the Kool-Aid um, like so-and-so has drunk the Kool-Aid or whatever um, meaning they are kind of blindly following something uh, so and that you can't like persuade them with and change their mind so that's basically all that I knew um, so, so far, the book's divided into three sections. It's divided into Indiana, California, and then Guiana. So, um, I am still in Indiana, but I'm at the end of Indiana. So, I think I'm about at the end of his, his, no, it was Flavor Aid. Um, it was Flavor Aid. <laughs> so, I don't know why, I don't know why Kool-Aid got saddled with this because, yeah, it was not Kool-Aid. It was Flavor Aid. Did this still make Flavor Aid? Or did this finish off the Flavor Aid empire? Um, so, anyway, but yeah, that was. Uh, so, the book has been. It's what's been kind of crazy about the book is he was like, he and his wife were the first uh, white people in Indiana to like adopt um, children of color. They adopted multiple children from various different ancestries. And um, his churches, he was a, he was a kind of cr Christian preacher. Um, I think he had a Quaker and um, evangelical roots. And he had at various times relationships with various different types of Christian sex. Um, but he was, all his churches were always integrated and he always like helped um, the people in his churches who were getting like racist runaround from the local government, um, to get, help them solve their problems because, you know, by using his privilege as uh, a white man, um, 
and all of that. So, like, he has this really progressive backstory. Um, and um, so, the, the, you know, to think that he's going to eventually do all this wild stuff is, like, all, like, become this, like, mass murderer, essentially, like, megalomaniac or whatever. Now, that's not to say that he was, like, totally normal. <laughs> like, there were, pro there were signs. You know, but even the biographer says some of the stuff that people say who knew him as a kid, he says you can't really be sure about all of it, right? Because he said once Jim Jones was Jim Jones, then, you know, people started, he said there's lots of things that people say who knew him as a child the, that claims they make that are just like counterfactual, like you can actually, you know, it's not true because, you know, he wasn't in that he wasn't in that place at that time because he was in this other place and that's well known or whatever. So they said, so his kind of like his really early childhood, is kind of hard. Um, cause you really only have what he says about himself, which you can't really believe any of that. And then you have what other people say about him, which they said, you know, you can't totally believe about that. Um, and yes, anyone who didn't drink the cyanide, uh, was shot but some people did get away and there was a U.S. Congress person there at the time like investigating the cult and they got involved and like um, they tried to escape on a on a plane and the plane crashed and it's the plane crash that like brings the whole situation to the attention of the local government and so they have to assemble kind of like a small army slash search and rescue. This is how the book starts, actually, um, with the government uh, trying to assemble this like small army search for search and rescue. And what they end up doing is getting Vietnam veterans. Um, they just find Vietnam veterans who are living there. Um, and they kind of put together like a temporary army because they figured they would know how to fight in a jungle. Um, so that like it's it's all like even the government's response is kind of interesting because you know they have this problem where they're like well what are we going to do about like they're americans mostly you know they're not, <laughs> they're not our citizens so anyway it's like it sounds like it's a well, i mean a total disaster at the end of course um and it's like an inner a whole international affair um foreign foreign <laughs> foreign relations crisis but um yeah, I think it's it's just um, it's going to be interesting to see how he kind of becomes like Jim Jones, the cult leader. Now, he's already just met where I am, as like I said, I'm at the end of the section called Indiana, and he's just met another cult leader. Um, and he's just like mesmerized, wowed by him and thinks he's like just doing the smartest thing. And so he's going to he's going to start modeling some of this guy's behavior so part of it, he is at least somewhat himself influenced by another cult leader. Um, so that seems clear. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was just doing a lot of good work for a lot of years. And then, you know, and it seems like the biographer thinks that he kind of always had some like delusions of grandeur and like, stuff like that but that he was kind of channeling it in a way that was productive for society and you know, you know people who have like you know issues um can you know still totally accomplish all kinds of great stuff so it's just that at some point he's going to stop channeling it in a positive direction obviously um but it's like 800 pages so it's going to take me a while to get through it um but yeah it's um it's interesting um, and like I said, I just picked it up because I was hearing this particular biographer praised and that was the book my library had available without any weight. Um, so, but he's written about other people from kind of around the same time. Um, but the next section is California. So I think we're going to find, figure out, I think that's where he starts the people's temple, um, is in California. So he, that's where he's going to start the cult is what I think. Um, I think he's just now getting the idea for the cult and then he's going to go to California and start it. But I, I don't know why he's going to leave Indiana or any of that. So it still remains to be seen. But, um, yeah. We shall see. Um, but Cat's Cradle is a fiction book about, I, I believe, a cult as well. So uh, science fiction book about a cult. So I thought they might 
blend well together. So I'll let you know next week if I've learned anything else wild about Jim Jones. But um, I mean, anything wilder than what everyone already knows about Jim Jones, which is quite a lot, quite a lot. So, um, but yeah, anyway. All right. Well, on that note, I am going to head off because we have finished all our inserts. Crazy. We have made so much progress. We did all our matting and we constructed all of our inserts. So now all we have to do is decorate our inserts and then add any other inserts and embellishments we want to. And then we'll make the cover and all of that. So, but yeah, we are just chugging right along with this one. Uh, this one's coming together very well. Happy with that. What's causing this shadow? Huh. Interesting. I have no idea what causes, what's causing that shadow. I'll have, I, I don't know, whatever. Oh, is it the mouse? Oh my gosh, it's the mouse. Uh, <laughs> clearly someone needs to go to bed <laughs> and that someone is probably named Catherine. All right. Thank you so much for joining me this evening, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and, uh, I will see you next week. We're going to decorate the inserts. We're going to add photo mats, going to add all kinds of goodies to the pockets and such and go from there. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye now.